My family moved out of my childhood house when I was eight. We didn't go far, but still, something about the move felt unsettling. The memories I'd made with my family were kneaded into the walls of that house, each mark having its own story. I'll never forget the look on my mother's face when I broke the kitchen window with a baseball. But that moment was memorialized in a discolored window we found to replace it. To anyone else, this tiniest of details would be looked past, and even if noticed, could be explained away in a hundred other ways. Or the height marks in the hallway my dad would make each year on my birthday, gently pushing my head down with his yellow legal pad when I tried to cheat. My memories were rooted in the walls of this house, so it was hard to take them with me when we left. I wonder if the family that moved in after us noticed all we'd left behind when we packed up our belongings. Did they notice the different colored window in the kitchen or the height marks in the hallway? And if they did, what did they think about us? How might they have imagined us out of the marks we'd left? What does someone look like if you can only see them through the objects they've interacted with? This is how I'm getting to know a medieval woman who, for the sake of the story, I've named Eleanor. A few years ago, I started studying a manuscript that belonged to her, which was written and illuminated in northern France during the early 15th century. The manuscript is a prayer book known as a Book of Hours, a devotional guide for private spiritual practice outside of the church, which became popular in the late medieval period. They typically contained a calendar of feast days, gospel readings, worship texts for different times of the day, and other miscellaneous prayers, depending on the person who commissioned it. I saw this manuscript for the first time, my sophomore year, while working as a research assistant for special collections in the archives of Tisch Library. I never could have imagined that I would spend the next three years researching this object, eventually writing my thesis on it, or that I would be up here talking about it today. But instead of talking about where I am now, I want to talk about where I started, how I began researching an object that had never before been studied, and that was only known through a single line in a 1961 gift acknowledgement that I found in the university archives. I approached this object like a new family moving into an old home. Instead of immediately moving in my own academic frameworks, I sat with the pages of parchment vacant of the people who had once lived there and looked around for the windows. One of the first things that struck me about this manuscript is that it's bilingual. The calendar of feast days that begins the text is in French, while the prayers that follow are in Latin. In the 15th century, French was overtaking Latin in popularity outside of the church. In fact, the owner of this manuscript most likely didn't speak fluent Latin. So why have the prayers in Latin? And then why have the calendar in French? Were they to be understood differently, read by different people? The calendar makes sense. Think of your own calendar. The words are pretty much the only thing that matter when you're trying to remember an appointment. But if the prayers weren't read literally, then how were they? I returned to Special Collections a few months later to see this manuscript again and to write about it for an upcoming exhibition at the Art Gallery. The curator of Rare Books was happy to work with me, but asked if I could read Latin since it was the main language of the text. Now, my study of Latin started and ended in the sixth grade, but I said yes anyway, figuring I could rely pretty heavily on word reference if need be. But as it turns out, I didn't need Latin or French to read the manuscript at all. Confused by the indecipherable script and not sure if I would recognize the Latin beneath it anyway, I began by translating the pages of text into a language I spoke, or rather saw. I used a spatial vocabulary and literacy to read patterns, shapes, and markings. I looked at each page and tried to find its discolored window. What I found was the house of more than one person whose lives had grown into the parchment to make a home. I started going through to get a sense of what an average page looks like. There's a small field of text, dense black lettering, and a few decorated initials. So I'm going through, and most pages look something like this. But as I continue, they begin to look different. If the page were itself an image, the composition completely changed. Instead of a text block with modest illumination, the pages became lists, each line having its own decorated initial. Another pattern I noticed changing was in the background of the pages of text, or images as I was thinking. Every few pages, I noticed what looks like pepper. Hundreds of little black dots scattered in clumps beneath the text. 
What were these dots, and how was their clumping to be understood? And sometimes it wasn't the object itself that I noticed, but rather how it had been used. One of the illuminations in this manuscript is of the Annunciation. Gabriel coming to Mary to ask if she will conceive Jesus in her womb. The image is well preserved, aside from a small, worn down area on Gabriel's robe. What was this wear from, and why was it only on that one spot? Or a few pages later, when I noticed this transparent spill. What was it, and why was it on this particular page? Or this page, which looks messy, but what kind of a mess is it? It looks as though red and blue paint rubbed off along the edge from the facing page, but there's no paint anywhere across from it, so where did this residue come from? I let these and other observations drive my research. I started out feeling like I didn't have enough knowledge to do this work, that since I didn't read Latin or know much about medieval anything, I couldn't do this work. And there was a reason I felt like I needed those skills for this study because someone else had already studied a manuscript in that way, and they were successful at it. But if I'd done that and spent a year on word reference, reading would have just become a recitation of someone else's creativity. Instead, I thought, how can I make this my own? By stopping and looking, seeing words as windows, I used my visual vocabulary to learn about the object's structure, material makeup, patterns of usage, and history. From this first example, I learned about the different sections in the text. The first text block, written in prose, is a gospel reading, while the second, written as a list, is the litany, a list of saints, prophets, and martyrs Eleanor would have prayed to. When I found out what this next example was, it honestly grossed me out in a can't look, but still have to look sort of way. The black dots that look to be embedded into the parchment are actually hair follicles of the animal whose skin was used to make this book. The patterning and size of the follicles can help to determine the type of animal the parchment was made from. Based on the two sizes and their irregular patterning, I believe this parchment was made from the skin of an adult sheep. So what about Gabriel? What could this worn, damaged area possibly offer? Notice the circular outline created by the wear. This was intentional. It's evidence for a tactile component of prayer, a tangible entrance to Eleanor's spiritual contemplation. You can almost see her kneeling with this book and tracing her fingers in a circle as she meditates on this scene. She recognized a meaning in this touch beyond what was offered by the words or images. Now the spill I was less sure about. It's not ink or paint. It only appears on certain pages and it feels raised to the touch. I guess that it was candle wax. I then translated the prayer and learned that this is the office of Vespers, the second to last office of the day, which makes sense. As the sun set and it was time for Vespers, Eleanor would have opened her book, lit her candle, and begun to pray. This last example speaks to a later history of the object. Based on the residue, I thought there might be a page missing. This was confirmed by translating the prayer and noticing that the entire last verse is missing. Calculating the average number of characters per, per line for this prayer as 24, I can roughly estimate that six lines or about half a page of text is missing. Perhaps the other half was filled with a red and blue illumination. The point of all these examples is that no one language holds the vocabulary to read them. Of course, Latin or art history would help, but those are tools there to answer questions, not to produce them. I wouldn't have had any ideas to explore if I hadn't spent time looking at the start. In getting to know this object, I've gotten to know Eleanor. I've studied her practice of prayer and noticed how interactive it was. I've thought about her ability to read and what this might have meant for a woman at the time. I've even imagined myself as her, what it might have been like to flip through these pages at night and see the candlelight flicker across the gilded illuminations of Mary. What I'm studying isn't actually a manuscript. It's the meaning that manuscript had for a particular woman, the web of relationships it weaves together. For me, the text illustrated the images, not vice versa, because reading, like observation, 
is about creativity. Curiosity was my eyesight and academic learning my glasses. Without glasses, you still have eyes blurry as your sight may be, but without eyes, glasses can't help. So what are your eyes and what are your glasses? What do you read and how do you read it? Through what lens did Eleanor read this book? Because if what I'm saying is that there's no one language with which to read this book, maybe earlier, when I was thinking about Eleanor's knowledge of Latin, that was the wrong question. If I didn't need Latin to read this manuscript, why did she? What if Eleanor was relying on her own brand of reading? What if hers was a spiritual literacy, one that accessed meaning separate from the semantics and from the visual? What if she read the words of this language through touch? So are you like Eleanor, reading through touch? Or are you like me, reading a book without the words? Or do you read through the eyes of a child or a parent? There are as many ways to read as there are people, if not more. How you read is as important as what you read. So unlearn to read how you were taught, how you're comfortable. And instead, notice what your eyes are interested in. Try on a new pair of glasses and explore the creativity in reading. Thank you.